All right, here we are. Chat. <laughs> okay. Yes. Thank you, Kaylee. Uh, all right. Now we're recording. Uh, okay. So yeah, again, chapter, uh, we're doing chapter six today, but uh, first there's this question from the unit analysis worksheet that I wanted to go over because uh, it was especially tricky. So the question was, is that the price of gold is 116 Sorry, 116. 1,611. I'm going to write the dollar sign back here because that's where we write our other units. Dollars per ounce. And the exchange rate is $1 per uh, 0 0.7730 euros. I don't think I've ever written a euro symbol before. Um, how much will it cost an investor in France to purchase 100 kilograms of gold? So the setup for this problem is not exactly straightforward. I think what you need to realize um, for a problem like this is that uh, if you're using, again, that uh, solution diagram, you want to figure out what you're going to end with on this problem because there are a lot of units flying around. And so we want to end with euros, right? We want to know how many euros an investor in France has to pay to purchase 100 kilograms of gold. And from there, this is kind of where you have to um, have a little bit of intuition about how to solve these. Um, I think one of the things that I, the thing I would do first is to say this is the conversion factor that we're going to want to use, but it's in dollars per ounce. And since we're trying to go from kilograms of gold to euros, we can convert this $1,611 per ounce into euros per kilogram. <clears throat> So I know for this unit analysis worksheet, you were supposed to use uh, the units that were provided at the top. I'm not sure if everybody did that, but okay. So again, when you're doing these conversion, I don't know why I keep switching those. When you're doing a conversion, it's easiest to do one unit at a time. And remember that <clears throat> we're basically swapping units out here. So uh, we're given in the problem our, let's do dollars, convert dollars to euros first. So we're swapping it out, right? So we want to put 0 0.7730 euros. Looks worse every time I write it. Euros on the top because we're swapping, uh, we're swapping dollars with euros. And so because we're swapping it out, we want to cancel it. So on the bottom, we'll put $1. Who else is super excited for it to be like 107 degrees today? It's just going to be so great. My office gets hot. And then once we've converted... I just drove back from the beach yesterday and went from like 60 degrees to 102. Oh. I got so sad. <laughs> yeah, my, my wife and I drove... We're actually moving down to Visalia, but we drove down there to look at um, places. And um, it was hot. It's hot. Fortunately, we were in the car most of the time, but. All right, so now that we've converted um, dollars to euros. I've got, I've got a quick question real quick, sort of. A, yeah. Just a, but, um, is there a way to pin the video, like your video feed, so then when we're watching the recording, it does, like if people ask questions and stuff, it doesn't cut away the screen? Because right oh. now, like I'm recording, if somebody asks a question, your screen goes away and their, their little name box pops up. Oh, weird. Um, yeah, like yeah there because is, so if you hover over his name or the video, no, then, that's I know. But in the recording side, I'm talking about like on his recording. Gotcha. Does it still cut away for you guys? I thought by oh, here we go. If I spotlight yeah, I've this, got, I've got a, your video, so then it doesn't cut away. But I, I think you might need to do the same thing. So on the recording, it doesn't cut away. Okay, so I was pinning the video for myself. Not for everybody. Thank you. I did not realize that that's how that works. So I've got my video spotlighted now. 
Um, and that should force it essentially to pin for everybody and hopefully for the recording. Okay. Does somebody else want to talk or is, is the screen going black on my name or, or? No, it's good. It's pinned on his now. There we go. Okay. Yeah, you're, you're... okay. Thank you for that. Yeah. I hadn't actually checked that cause I only go to the uh, YouTube recording. Um, oh wait, were there any, <laughs> sorry, were there any other questions? Cool. All right. So after converting our dollars to euros, now we'll convert ounces to kilograms, and that's the one that we're given uh, at the top of the page here. And that is, oh right, we got to do. We're going to go from ounces to grams first. And again, since we want to replace ounces on the bottom, we're going to put ounces on the top so that they cancel. Uh, and then on the bottom. 28.35 grams and then this one by now hopefully you have off the top of your head that a thousand grams is one kilogram uh, so uh, sixteen hundred and eleven dollars times point seven seven three times one thousand and then the only number we have on the bottom, so right, these are all sort of implied ones. The only number we have on the bottom is 28.35. So you should get this really large number, 43926, you know, too many sig figs here, but uh, when you're doing these intermediate calculations, you want to take as many sig figs as you can with you to avoid, so now we're doing euros per kilogram. And that makes sense, right? An ounce, an ounce is much less than a kilogram. Um, so if we're already at $1,600 per ounce, then when we go to kilograms, a kilogram of gold should be very expensive. Um, and now that we have that, we can just multiply this. And actually, I'll flip these because that's kind of the way we I've been setting them up in general. Now we can just say 100 kilograms of gold. And really, this unit is kilograms of gold. And we just multiply. So you end up getting 100 times that. And then the answer should be in scientific notation. Four, five, six, 4.39 times 10 to the 6 euros. So just for anybody who I think where uh, it gets confusing is trying to do the, the solution. I mean, like, yeah. just if you're thinking on it logically, it's like, okay, $1,611 per ounce. Well, just multiply that 16. Okay, that's how much you have per pound, 2.205. You know what I mean? Like, so you can just kind of, mm -hmm. for me at least, I can sort of think through it. But to try to write out the solution, that's where it is. Yeah, yeah, to try and plot this out, because it's almost, it's almost two steps, right? You have to do one step first to get your conversion factor right, and then you can do the next step. And so yeah. the solution map is kind of like, if it works for a problem, do it for a problem. If it doesn't, if, you, if you're really struggling with the solution map, then yeah, just try and um, think about it. And that's the other thing, too. It's a good point about these kind of unit conversion problems, right? Like, I went from ounces to grams to kilograms. You could have also done ounces to pounds, to kilograms um, as long as you have a conversion factor and the units cancel you can kind of manipulate it however you want and that's the power of understanding unit analysis um, that being said this next chapter is very reliant on dimensional analysis <laughs> um, so we're going to be talking today then about chemical composition. So sodium is an important dietary mineral that we eat in our food, primarily a sodium chloride, but sodium is also <clears throat> involved in uh, the regulation of body fluids and eating too much of it can lead to high blood pressure. Um, and there's just, you can eat just so much salt. It's kind of ridiculous. Um, 
The FDA recommends a person consumes less than 2.4 grams or 2,400 milligrams of sodium per day. That's like a decent little pile of salt. Uh, if you were to just measure out table salt. Um, and actually, yeah, we'll get to that in a second. But the mass of sodium that we eat is not the same as the mass of sodium chloride that, or sorry, the mass of sodium that we eat isn't the same as the sodium chloride, right? Because this dietary uh, dietary recommendation is for sodium and A, and when we eat salt, table salt, it's sodium chloride. And there are other ways that you can get sodium as well. It's not all sodium chloride, um, but most of it is. So, how many grams of sodium chloride can we consume and still stay, stay below the FDA recommendation for sodium? That's the question that we'll be answering. So, the, the chemical composition of sodium chloride is given in its formula, NaCl. So, there's one sodium, like I showed on the previous slide, there's one sodium to every chloride ion. Since the masses of sodium and chlorine are different, the relationship between the mass of sodium and the mass of sodium chloride is not clear from the chemical formula alone right, because sodium, actually I need to pull up a periodic table here that has the uh, atomic masses, because we're going to be using that a lot today. Um, right, because we have these atomic masses for each of these uh, elements in our periodic table, and we can use those then to calculate the mass percent Let's zoom this in. I need to zoom this in. Okay. So, right, like sodium, the atomic mass of sodium is 22.99. The atomic mass of chlorine is 35.45. These are in atomic mass units, right? AMU. So the amount of an element in a compound can be calculated using the chemical formula along with the formula mass um, or the atomic masses. <clears throat> so if a mining company needs to know how much iron is in a given amount of iron ore, they need to then take that iron ore and do a compositional analysis and see how much of that iron ore is actually iron atoms and how much is other atoms really. If we're estimating the threat of ozone depletion, uh, we need to know the amount of chlorine that is in a given chlorofluorocarbon. This is not such a big deal anymore um, since chlorofluorocarbons have been mostly phased out. Um, I actually happen to know a lot about that topic. If you want to know more about that, you can ask me later. <clears throat> um, well, I guess we'll build up to atomic mass here. So. If you go to a hardware store, uh, you can buy nails and screws and things by the pound for certain ones. Um, and cu customers, because customers often need hundreds of nails and to count individual nails takes too long. So a customer still needs to know at least approximately um, the number of nails contained in a given weight of nails. So this is similar then to when we ask the question, how many atoms are in a given mass of an element, right? So we don't we don't measure the number of atoms in anything per se, but we use the mass, and from the mass we can calculate the number of atoms. So if you go to the hardware store and buy 2.6 pounds of medium-sized nails, and a dozen nails weighs 0 0.15 pounds, how many nails did you buy? So. If we have then 2.60 pounds of nails, and we have, when we know a dozen nails weighs 0 0.15 pounds, this is why we've been doing all of this unit, unit analysis, right? Because we can make 12 nails is equal to 0 0.150 pounds of nails, really. And so this is now a conversion factor. Right? And so we could say, oh, well, I have, I have nails on top here. I have nails in my conversion factor. I can just multiply zero point one five 
0 0.150 pounds of nails, right? And our nails here cancels so that we get, um, oh, sorry, I flipped this. Whoops. We have pounds of nails and pounds of nails. So we want to go from pounds of nails to how many individual nails we should have. So that our pounds of nails, and this is why it's important then to write out your units. Uh, as you can see, I just got confused. But because I wrote out what units were in my conversion factor, I knew that I was doing it wrong because I was going to end up with the wrong units. But now we can just do 2.6 times 12 divided by 0 0.150 and get 208 nails. Now, when you measure things out like this, there's always going to be, you know, a little more, a little less. It's not going to come out to exactly 208 nails. And that's why when we do, when we do some of the math around these, there's just like a little bit of error in one way or the other, because there might be just like a few more atoms in there or a few fewer atoms. Um, and similarly, when you go to the hardware store and you buy nails, they want to sell you maybe 200 nails, but you get eight extra nails because they're not weighing it out super exactly. So when we count atoms, we're essentially doing the same thing as counting nails per pound. Getting a phone call, but if it's important, they'll leave a message. Okay, so uh, with atoms again, we're using, just like with the nails, we're using their mass as a way to count them because atoms are way too small and way too numerous to count individually. If you spent, if you could see atoms and counted them for 24 hours a day, as long as you lived, you would barely begin to count the number of atoms in something as small as a grain of sand. So, we count atoms by the gram uh, because we're not going to spend our entire lives and we can't even see atoms. So a dozen is a convenient number for nails or eggs or um, a lot of things. Um, but we need a larger number because atoms are so small. So the chemist's dozen then is called the mole. And you can think of the mole like like we talk about a thousand, right? You say one. there's one thousand pennies, or there's 1,000 cats, or 1 million cats, or 1 billion cats, or a trillion dollars. These are just counting numbers, or they're counting words, right? So when we say there's one mole, what we're saying is that there are 6.022 times 10 to the 23, which is just a stupid big number. I mean, it's just, I mean, it really is incomprehensible. Uh, and this is Avogadro's number named after uh, Amadeo Avogadro. The mole, you'll be very familiar with the mole, right? So if we talk about a mole of copper atoms, that's approximately uh, 22 pennies. Or if we have a mole of helium atoms, right? So we can use then the mole to convert from this, you know, crazy big number of atoms to stuff at a human scale that we can like interact with and understand. Um, and so we count atoms also by the gram. So we've got these built-in conversion factors on the periodic table for converting from the number of grams of something to the number of moles of something. Because the numerical value of the mole is defined as being equal to the number of atoms in exactly 12 grams of pure carbon 12. Um, and if you notice from the periodic table, Carbon-12 has six protons and six neutrons, which is why we, I believe that's why we use carbon-12. Also, it's incredibly abundant. So this definition of the mole establishes then a relationship between mass, grams of carbon, and number of uh, atoms, right? So if we were to convert this, we would say that there's 12 grams of carbon is equal to one mole 
of carbon. And it's not much of an abbreviation, but you can abbreviate mole as just M-O-L. Save you one more character. And this is then how we use um, these atomic masses to calculate the number of moles, or vice versa. So when we convert between moles and the number of atoms, it's similar to count converting between dozens and number of nails, right? So one dozen is equal to 12 nails. One mole of anything is equal to 6.022 times 10 to the 23 atoms. So you could have one mole of nails, um, but that would be, you know, enough nails to just completely cover the earth, uh, literally completely cover the earth. That's not figurative. Um, <clears throat> so let's convert 9.5 times 10 to the 27 atoms to moles. So how many moles would that be? So if we got 9.5 times 10 to the 27, again, I'm starting with what we have, and that's atoms. And then we have our conversion factor for this here, right? One mole is that many atoms. So we have <clears throat> atoms, and we want to cancel that. Whoops. Uh, with atoms here, and so we'll say we're multiplying by 6.022 times 10 to the 23, and then on top we have one mole. Right, so then that these cancel out, and we're left with units of moles. Uh, so. Again, and now, now this is why that E, the E E key, on your calculator is so important to have because it saves you in the long run a lot of time typing this in, over and over. <clears throat> so we still end up with one point five four, uh, one point five eight. Oh, sorry, uh, 1.6 times 10 to the 1, 2, 3, 4. 1 1.6 times 10 to the 4 moles. So we'll do this again. So now, now instead of counting the, uh, you know, just doing this general conversion, let's talk about gold. So how many gold atoms are in a pure gold ring containing 8.83 times 10 to the negative 2 moles of gold. So 8.3 times 10 to the negative 2. And now we have moles, right? And we know our conversion factor. One mole is equal to 6.022 times 10 to the 23 atoms. Right, and so we want to then, we have moles, moles, so we're going to cancel those guys out. And we're going to put one mole over 6.022 times 10 to the 23 atoms. Right, so we're going to end up with units of atoms. 8.83 times 10 to the negative 2 times 6.022 times 10 to the 23, and we get 5.32 times 10 to the 22 atoms of gold. So you could do silly things too, right? So if you went back to that unit analysis worksheet and you wanted to calculate how much is a single atom of gold worth, at least according to that, or you could look up like the uh, whatever the going rate of gold is on the market, and you could calculate how much is a single atom of gold worth, and you'll find that it is something like uh, ten to the negative twenty-three dollars. <clears throat> so when we're converting then between grams and moles of an element, uh, we've kind of covered that for the most part, but now we need one more conversion factor. For nails, we used the weight of one dozen nails. For atoms, we can use the mass of one mole of atoms. 
right, if we're counting individual atoms. And the molar mass, though, is the mass of one mole of atoms of an element, which is numerically equal to the atomic mass in grams. Oh, I guess I already covered this a little bit. But Avogadro's number, then, is the number of carbon-12 atoms and exactly 12 grams of carbon-12. So the atomic mass unit is 1 12th the mass of a carbon-12 atom. And so the reason that this matters and is different for different atoms is because sometimes we have uh, large nails, or we have large atoms that are very heavy, or we have small nails, which are very light. And if you look at a periodic table, right, the lightest it gets is hydrogen, right? So if we have one gram of hydrogen, that's one mole. But you can go all the way down to something like, uh, well, gold, for example. Gold has an atomic mass of 196.97 grams per mole. So if you had uh, one mole of gold, that would weigh 196.97 grams. So almost 200 times that what hydrogen would weigh. And here's another example of that, right? So we have um, sulfur, which has an atomic mass of 32.07, and that's one mole of sulfur, but carbon only has an atomic mass of 12.01. So one mole of carbon weighs much less, you know, weighs 20 grams less. So the mass of one mole of atoms changes for different elements, right? Like we just showed in the previous slide, 32 grams of sulfur is equal to one mole. 12 grams of carbon is equal to one mole of carbon. And 6.94 grams of lithium is equal to one mole of lithium. So when we talk about molecules especially, which we'll get to, but if we're talking about different atoms, you need to know the molar mass to be able to convert from how many grams that is to how many moles that is. So the lighter the atom, the less mass in one mole of that atom, right? It's like having small nails, right? So carbon is, is medium-sized nails, maybe. Lithium are the small nails, and sulfur would be your large nails. For one dozen of each, they're going to weigh different amounts. And our molar mass is then the conversion factor between grams and moles. So let's look then at calcium. Calcium, if we have nine... 91.4 grams of calcium. Um, let's see how many moles that is. So calcium has an atomic mass, and I'm going to write this here, 40.08 grams of calcium equals one mole of calcium. Pulled straight off the periodic table at the back of the, or I think this periodic table is actually in the front of the book. If you have the digital version, it's in the back matter chapter or section, which is what I'm using. Okay, so now we need to, right, we want to know the number of moles. And so we're going to take, we have grams, grams of calcium. We're going to cancel that with grams of calcium. So we're going to get uh, 40.08 grams of calcium and one mole of calcium. All right, so now that our now our units cancel and we're going to end up with moles of calcium. Uh, where'd my calculator go? So 91.4 divided by 40.08 is going to equal 2.28 grams, nope, not grams, moles of calcium. So it's, it's just like any of the other conversion factors we've worked with. You just have to know that every element then has its own conversion factor, and that can be found on the periodic table. And those are always given as, on the periodic table, they're always given as grams per mole. Grams per mole. So we'll do another one here. So we'll, or, or we'll do the opposite, I should say. We're going to do 2.78 moles of sulfur. And we want to convert that into uh, grams of sulfur, right? So even before we look up our conversion factor, 
we could already say that moles of sulfur is going to go on the bottom, grams of sulfur is going to go on the top. And so we know that on the periodic table, these are always grams per one mole. That's sort of implied. One mole. But 32.06 grams of sulfur is equal to one mole of sulfur. So we can take 32.06, right, and then our units here cancel, and we get 2.78 times 32.06 to get 89.1 grams of sulfur. And always make sure that you're checking too, right, checking through your units that you've got, right? So moles and moles canceled, and that leaves us with grams. So the units here should match. Uh, they should match not only, you know, whatever you're converting with, but they should match what you're looking for in the answer. So we can also then write, because we know one mole is equal to 6.022 times 10 to the 23, we can go from grams to moles to atoms, right? So we're just adding another step in there. And so we can say we have 0 0.58 grams of diamond. And if you know about diamonds, diamonds are made of carbon. So we have 0 0.58 grams of carbon. And now we want to convert from grams to moles. So right, if you had your solution diagram, we're starting here with grams. We're going then to moles. And then we're going to go to atoms. We can check our periodic table for carbon. And we know it's 12.01 grams per one mole. Again, write these units in. And then, all right, so this is our conversion factor for moles, and then we know that one mole of anything, but in this case we're talking about carbon, is going to be 6.022 times 10 to the 23 atoms of carbon. So we'll do 0 0.58 times 6.022 times 10 to the 23 divided by 12.01. So what I'm doing there, at least on my calculator, uh, you can do it several ways, is I always do the multiply across the top first, and then I just divide by divide by what's on the uh, denominator, or the bottom. And we get 2.9 times 10 to the 22 atoms of carbon. So now we'll calculate the mass, right? So let's go the other way. We just went from a number of grams of something to the number of atoms, and we can very easily go the opposite direction. So I'll do these solution diagrams intermediate, intermediate, intermittently the word I was going for. So we're starting with atoms. For these problems that are, that are very straightforward, right? We're not converting a conversion factor. It's very easy to do a solution diagram. We go from atoms to moles, and then from moles, we can go to grams. So as far as atoms go, we know we're starting with 1.23 times 10 to the 24 helium atoms. Oh, not ATM, because that's atmospheres. Let's slide this over. Okay, so then to go from atoms to moles, it's the same conversion factor every time. We have 6.022 times 10 to the 23 atoms. And hopefully by me saying it over and over and over and over again to <laughs> ad nauseum, if you will, uh, it'll just kind of burrow itself into your brain. And then that'll give us one mole. 
And then if we look up the atomic mass of helium, it's 4.00 grams, right? 4.00 grams per one mole helium. And again, once you've got it all written out, you can just multiply across the top. 1.23 times 10 to the 24 uh, times 4 divided by 6.022 e to the 23. So we have 8.17 moles of helium. Sorry, grams of helium. This is what I was saying earlier, right? If we had nails and we had 6.022 times 10 to the 23 nails, they would cover the earth. Uh, if you just had pennies, 22 pennies is equal to 6.022 times 10 to the 23 copper atoms. But if you took 6.022, a mole of pennies, they would cover the entire earth's surface to a depth of 300 meters like including the oceans, right? This isn't just a land mass. Like let's just say all of the oceans freeze over. And if you were to treat the earth as I'm sure they've treated here a sphere, it's a depth of 300 meters, 300 meters deep of pennies. Uh, and so then one crystal of granulated sugar has a mass of less than one milligram and a diameter of less than 0.1 millimeters, but one mole of sugar cut crystals would cover the state of Texas to a depth of several feet. So the the numbers that we're working with here, like this is why we use moles instead, because it doesn't make sense to, to work with things at these just incredible numbers. Um, you run into the same thing if you've ever um, looked at the distances in space. Um, like the distance to the moon is like 240, roughly 240,000 miles. So if you've got a really good car, you can drive your car to the moon. Um, but it takes years and years and years of driving to do that. So if we count, count molecules uh, by the gram. For elements, the molar mass, the mass, is the mass of one mole of atoms of that element. For compounds, the molar mass is the mass of one mole of molecules, or formula units of that compound if we're dealing with ionic compounds. right? So in ionic compounds, we don't have individual molecules. Um, instead, we've got these, uh, I'm trying to remember if they're all crystal, but we've got these mostly crystal lattices right, of repeating formula units. And so we talk about those in terms of a single formula unit. And we can convert then between the mass of a compound and the moles of the compound. Um, then we calculate the number of molecules or formula units from moles. So the molar mass of a compound in grams per mole is numerically equal to the formula mass of the compact compound in atomic mass units. The molar mass of a compound in grams per mole is numerically equal to the formula mass of the compound in atomic mass units. So the formula mass for a compound is the sum of the atomic masses of all the atoms in a chemical formula. I'm reading these things slowly and I'm reading them more than once because they're a little bit confusing to, to hear the first time or to read the first time, so you have to go over it a couple of times. So let's calculate the formula mass of uh, calcium nitrate, right? So we have, and this is what we were talking about. There's not really, I guess we don't cover a formula for this, but let's, let's do it this way, right? So we have, we have calcium, calcium is equal to 40.08, uh, nitrogen is equal to 14.01, Oxygen is equal to 15.99, I believe that's the value, 
Oh, they give 6 6. Sorry, 16.00 on the. We'll use the periodic table. 16.00. Right? And so now we need to know the number of each of these. So we have one calcium. We have two nitrogens, right? Because we're this uh, nitrogen times two, because we have two of those units. And then we have six oxygens. And so you can type this then into your calculator um, as, right? It's going to be 40 times one. So we'll just do 40. 0.08, um, not enough room. Right, so this is going to be 40.08 oh, times 1, 14.01 oh, one times 2, 16.00 oh, times 6. And then you take these numbers and then add them together, and that gives you your, your formula mass. 1401 times 2 plus 16 times 6. So you get 164.1. One. And if we were to do the molar mass of calcium nitrate, we will get the same number because it's calculated the same way. <clears throat> so here, I'll even just Google, I'll Google it. Let's see what, calcium nitrate, molar mass, 164.088, right? So if we had used more precision, 164, and we'll use the same level of precision, grams per mole. So let's find the number of moles in a 22.5 gram sample of dry ice or solid CO2. Oh. Did I do my math right? Yeah. Well, yeah, I should have <laughs> because it comes out to be right. So, okay, I'm just trying to, so I mean the formula mass and the molar mass is the same thing. Yes. Okay. Yeah, so these are the same. I mean, is there a time where it's different? Uh, not for the formula mass. Not for the formula mass. When we get to the empirical formula, so the empirical formula is the um, smallest whole number ratio. But the molecular formula, right, it's so, uh, I guess we'll see this in a couple slides, but if you have something like um, hydrogen peroxide, which is the example that we'll see early or later, the molecular formula is H2O2, but the empirical formula so, uh, write this. The empirical formula would be HO because oh, it's the yeah. simplest whole number ratio. So when you have um, when you have molecules like this, especially right, because uh, for an ionic compound, the empirical formula is the same as the formula unit for ionic compounds. But for molecular compounds, the number of each atom matters. Um, but we'll, we'll, we'll see that in a bit. Yeah, so formula mass is the same as the molar mass for uh, uh, compounds. Which I think is just the distinction between, because we call the molecular, or the, the molecular, the molar mass of an element, and this is just trying to show you that when we calculate the ma mass of a uh, compound, we calculate it using a formula. That's why it's the formula mass, but that is also equal to the molar mass. So it's kind of a, a, a semantics. Yeah. Right, so molar mass, formula mass for compounds are the same. 
So let us do now then, uh, so we have CO2. So the first thing we want to do is calculate our molar mass or formula mass for CO2. Again, we have carbon, oxygen, carbon is 12.01. And here you might be thinking, oh, why is it 12.01? But if you remember, we have isotopes. And so there's an is there are, I think, two other isotopes of um, carbon. I can't remember if 13 is a carbon. Then there's carbon-14 dating. So there's carbon-13, carbon-14 that occur at very, very small quantities. And the molar mass that's on your periodic table then is the average for naturally occurring isotopes. So that's why you get these odd numbers. Odd meaning strange. <clears throat> Not exact whole numbers. So then for oxygen, we have 16. And then we're going to multiply those by the number that we have in our, uh, our uh, compound, molecular formula. So we have one, one of carbon, two of oxygen. So we'll get, you know, 32 plus 12. We'll get 44.01 grams per mole CO2. Just as a note too, I noticed some people's uh, subscripts were floating a little bit. They were drifting around and they got, uh, saw some that were like, it would be like CO2. Uh, make sure those are obviously subscripts. Okay, so now we have our conversion factor. So we can say we have 22.5 grams of CO2 dry ice and we have 44.01 grams CO2 from our molecular formula or from our formula mass or molecular mass and that is one mole CO2 so it's 22.5 22.5 divided by 44.01 and we get 0.51 Five one one moles CO two. Any questions about that setup? Nope. Oh, all right, moving on. So now we'll calculate the number of moles of NO two. Uh, in 118 or 1, 1.18 grams of NO2. My brain is just not firing on all neurons today. Uh, so again, right? So NO, our mass for nitrogen, 14.01. And I should be writing these units in, right? So this is grams per mole. And then for oxygen, we're using 16.00. And you'll see these numbers uh, on different periodic tables vary just a little bit, uh, usually depending on how many significant figures they include. So then, and then we multiply, right? We have two oxygens, so we multiply that by two. You can think about this um, also kind of to go back to our nails, right? So we've got different, you can, think, you can think of every single atom as a different size nail. So when we have NO2, we've got this, you know, one nail that weighs 14 grams, and we've got another nail that weighs 16 grams. And so our formula mass then is the combination of, or molecular mass is then the combination of those three together. So 16, again 32, plus 14.01, and we'll get 46. grams per mole. So then we just take our 1.18 grams NO2 and then we have 46.01 grams NO2 per one mole so then we'll do 1.18 divided by 
zero point zero. We got three significant figures, so two, five, six. And then I'm just gonna write the units down here. So I ran out of space. But moles of NO2. Cool. So this is the you'll be doing a lot of these conversions one way or the other. Right? You'll be given a number of moles and it'll say calculate the number of grams of this compound. So how many water molecules are in a sample of water with a mass of 36 3.64 grams? So now we're going to be taking this one step further, right? So it can be helpful. We want water molecules, not moles of mo moles of water, <clears throat> water molecules. But again, we need to start by calculating our molecular mass for water which is one of those ones that you will probably end up memorizing. Um, so we have hydrogen, 1.01 grams per mole. We have oxygen at 16.00 grams per mole. We have two hydrogens, so we're going to multiply that by two. And we'll get, for H2O, we'll get 18.02 grams per mole. So we start with what we're given first, 3.64 grams H2O uh, times, and again, right, we have molar mass in grams per mole. We want to cancel out grams so that we can get to moles. So we do 18.02 grams, oh, ha <laughs> grams of H2O, one mole H2O. And then, because we're not looking for the number of moles of H2O, we're looking for the number of molecules. We remember that Avogadro's number, and make sure you look for that. I, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't so long ago that I was in general chemistry, and I remember doing this a lot. I would glance over the question and see that it was like, okay, water, I've got water, I've got a mass, I'm going to calculate the number of moles. Um, not always the case. Make sure you read the questions carefully. Um, so we know that one mole, one mole is equal to 6.022 times 10 to the 23. <clears throat> so we'll do 3.64 grams, right? And then we can just double check real quick. Grams, grams. We have moles of water here, we have moles here, and we have atoms up top. 3.64 times 6.022 E23, and then divide by 18.02. So that our answer will be 1.2. 1. 1. Two times ten to the twenty-three molecules. Molecules of H two O. And you might be thinking here, well, why was that molecules this time instead of atoms when we've done it before? But remember. I'm really just throwing that in there so we end up with the proper units. This is like, it's like a dozen, it's like a thousand, right? When we multiply, you know, if we have one cat or a thousand cats, it's it's a counting number, right? We can just convert between one and a thousand. Um, it's unitless. We're just um, just counting things. It's just a fast way to count things, really. So we can also use we can use other things as conversion factors too, right? So in this example, we have three leaves per one clover. So if we had, let's say, 14 clovers, how many leaves would that be? Well, we're given this as a conversion factor. So we say, okay, there's three leaves for every one clover. So 
if we put one clover and three leaves, you can see now how clover cancels out. We get 14 times three, which I feel like I should be able to do in my head, but I have a calculator. All right, and so we end up with 42 leaves. And we do this a lot, um, maybe without thinking about it. And actually there's, <laughs> I don't know if you've seen these uh, like on Facebook, yeah, they mostly show up on Facebook, where people are like, there's a cat and a table and a spider. How many legs are there? And, you know, they're always more ridiculous than, than that, and they're supposed to be tricky. Um, but essentially what you're doing is, right, every spider has eight legs. Every chair has four legs. And similarly, when we look at molecules... We can see that every H2O molecule, right, H, the H2 means that there's two atoms, two hydrogen atoms. So every H2O molecule has two hydrogen atoms. It's really the same thing. Um, and actually, uh, I will add this to the schedule, but there will be a quiz Thursday night. Um, it's just going to be like three problems, but it's going to be on this, uh, these unit conversions. Um, and using odd things like legs for a spider or legs on a chair, uh, I'm just going to make up a bunch of conversion factors. It'll be short. And you'll get a lot of time to do it because it's tricky, um, but it's very good practice, and it will be on the test. So maybe actually Wednesday night would be better. So, using chemical formulas as conversion factors, right? So we can look now at, um, so the relationships inherent in a chemical formula allow us to convert between moles of the compound and moles of a constituent element, and vice versa, right? Conversion factors can work both, both ways. So if we have um, carbon tetrachloride, we know that for every mole of carbon tetrachloride, we get four moles of uh, chlorine, right? It's just like if we said we had um, one mole of spiders, right? So how many moles of legs would we have? <laughs> it's gross to think about. I don't like it. But we'd get eight moles of legs, spider legs. Again, I hate saying it, but, right, so one mole of spiders, eight moles of spider legs, one mole of carbon tetrachloride, four moles of chlorine. <clears throat> so the formula then for carbon dioxide, CO2, right, means that there are two oxygen atoms per carbon molecule. So two oxygen atoms, one carbon molecule, two dozen oxygen atoms would mean we'd have one dozen carbon molecules <clears throat> or two moles of oxygen, one mole of CO2. So we've kind of gone the other way here now, right? So how many how many carbon you know molecules can you make with two uh, two oxygen atoms? You can make one carbon, one CO2. Or if you're going you know two dozen oxygen atoms, you can make t one dozen. Uh, CO2 molecules. So just keep that in your mind. Like, don't try not to get confused too much by the fact that these are, you know, chemicals and elements and all of these things. You can always go back to that. Okay, <laughs> you could put it into terms uh, that are maybe easier to understand, right? So you could say that um, for every person, let's do yeah, let's do another example here, right? So if we had people, right? So we have, oops two legs, um, well, I guess this would be two legs, right? And this would be one person. So if we had two dozen legs, that's enough legs for one dozen people. Or if we had two moles of legs, we could make one mole of people. 
It's really weird, um, but that is how it works. So if we find the number of moles of oxygen, right, and this is why you really have to read closely, moles of oxygen, not moles of CO2, or the number of moles of oxygen and 18 moles of CO2. So, 18 moles CO2. Again, that was another thing I noticed too sometimes, that it matters which letters are capitalized and which letters are not when you're writing out these chemical formulas because um, CO2 and CO2 are very different, right? This is carbon dioxide. This is two cobalt atoms. A question um, here, just before you even do the math, is sure. um, how, can we determine at this point already how many sig figs there are? Or if, because when, I, when I'm writing this out to find the moles, I, for carbon, for example, 12.011 AMU. So is that five sig figs? You know, is it kind of determinant yeah, okay. of which number we're using? So it depends on what we're talking about here, right? So if we're talking about molar masses, uh -huh. like you said, so if we have, if we're, if we're using the periodic table from the book, 12.01 grams of carbon, right, per mole. This is four sig figs. Yes. But right? if I'm using the, if I'm 12.011, if I'm using that one, if I'm using that number instead, can that's I, five. Is that, is that okay? Five sig figs? Mm hmm Okay. Yes, so, uh, especially on the test, I will, I would say on the test, use the, use whatever is on the periodic table in the book. <clears throat> um, because that will sort of standardize for all of the, all of the questions. And as much as possible, I would say, use the sig figs. If it's given in a, if it's given in the question stem, use that yeah of course yeah, if it's not given in the question good. stem i would default to the periodic table in the book but if you're showing your work especially on things that aren't the um you know test um although i think i will have people submit work for the test this time but if you um right so if it's given use that if it's not given use a periodic table uh from the book which is four sig figs for almost all of them. There are a few that are five. And then if we're talking about here with 18 moles of CO2, this is exact. Yeah. Right? Because we're counting the number of moles of CO2. Because there are so just, you know, it'd be yeah. like, like a dozen pennies is exactly one dozen pennies. Yeah. All right. Anything else? No, that's good. Thank you. Okay. Um, okay, right. So we have 18 moles of CO2. We want to know the number of moles of oxygen. So we don't need to go to grams or anything because we already know from the molecular formula, we have 18 moles of CO2. And then we have, from the molecular formula, we know that there are two oxygen atoms for every one carbon atom <clears throat> or for every one CO2. So we'll do two, we'll do one CO2 and two oxygens. So we'll get 36 oxygen or 36 um, moles of oxygen. And then I, I think too, for just the sake of clarity, right? You could also write this out as two uh, oxygen atoms is equal to one CO2 molecule. It's a little bit different now here, right? So we have uh, determined the number of moles of oxygen in 1.4 moles of H2SO4. So 1.4 moles H2, whoops, 
SO4. And again, we just need to determine then, right, moles of oxygen, how many oxygen atoms are there per uh, sulfuric acid molecule. Um, pretty easy for these ones, right? So we have four oxygen atoms per H2SO4. So we say we have one H2SO4, four oxygen atoms, and we'll get one, not one, 5.6 oxygen, 5.6 moles of oxygen. All right, so we can use these molecular formulas as our conversion factors and to find conversion factors, right? Because we could do this also for the hydrogens in there or the sulfur. All right, so how many moles of sulfur are there in 1.4 moles of sulfuric acid? Well, there's just one, one uh, sulfur atom per sulfuric acid molecule so we would have 1.4 sulfuric acid, or 1.4 moles of sulfur. <clears throat> so going back to this initial question that we asked, what mass of sodium chloride contains 2.4 grams of sodium? So let's convert then. This is kind of the question asked in reverse, right? Because we're given 2.4 grams of sodium, and we want to know the mass of sodium chloride. So we do two point, actually wait, is this then the next one? No, okay. I thought maybe that this was the next. So we have 2.4 grams of sodium and we want to convert it to <clears throat> grams of sodium chloride. So to do this, we need to, we need to convert it to moles first. Because 2.4 grams of sodium, we don't know how many, we don't right, know right now how many sodium atoms that we have. Um, because the masses don't convert one to one. So when we convert it then to uh, moles, and sodium is a mass of 22.99 grams per one mole. All right, so we can convert this, and then we'll get, um, I'm going to do this one out stepwise, and we'll get some more examples later, and I'll show you how you can kind of combine steps here. <clears throat> this is going to be 0 0.104, again, writing out too many sig figs, because when you type it into our calculator, you want to use as many sig figs as you can, because we're not done with it yet. All right, so we've got 1.0439. moles of sodium. Now we can say, okay, in sodium chloride, how many atoms of sodium are there per atoms of sodium chloride? Pretty easy. There's one, it's a one-to-one, -one, right? There's one sodium atom in each formula unit, right? Because sodium's a metal, chlorine is a non-metal, we've got an ionic compound. So for one formula unit, technically speaking, we have one sodium per one sodium formula unit of sodium chloride. So we can take our 0 0.10439 moles of sodium, right? You can see how this is basically what we did on the previous problem, but working in the opposite direction, right? We started with a molecule before, and we went from that molecule to numbers of an individual atom inside of that molecule. Now we're saying we've got this many moles of this atom, sodium, how many molecules of sodium will we be able to make? And because it's one-to-one, -one, the only thing you really need to worry about here um, is that it's one sodium, one sodium chloride, right? Because we're converting sodium to sodium chloride. Um, and then in our next step here, right? So we're gonna end up with moles of sodium chloride <clears throat> our 
uh, molecular weight of sodium chloride. All right, it's going to be sodium, 22.99 plus 35.45 to give 58.44 grams per mole. So now we're going from moles of sodium chloride to grams of sodium chloride. So we'll say 58.44 grams is one mole. And that'll give us our answer. So we'll take our uh, number from before times 58.44 and it'll give us 6.1, um, what, four sig figs? Well, maybe two sig figs because we started with 2.4. So two, two sig figs, 6.1 grams of sodium chloride. So you have 6.1 grams of table salt before hitting your daily cap of sodium daily recommended. <clears throat> so now let's determine the mass of oxygen in a 5.8 gram sample of sodium hydrogen carbonate. So if we have, again, right, so we need to, for most of these problems, you always need to go to moles at some point. So for this one, we've started with grams, and we're gonna go to moles of NaHCO3. And then from there, we can go from moles of NaHCO3 and convert to moles of uh, oxygen. And then, because we're looking for the mass of oxygen, we can go to uh, grams of oxygen. So we always have to go to moles, because when we're at moles, we're counting the actual number of atoms involved, or molecules, atoms or molecules involved. When we have the mass, um, the mass going from one element to another, right, they have different values. Uh, so you can't do that straightforwardly. So always go to moles first. And even if you do go from, even if you do just use the atomic or the molecular weights, you're actually going through moles at some point anyway. You've just smushed all the math together. Anyways. If you're keen on figuring out how to do that, there's a way to do it, uh, but I'll let you figure it out. <clears throat> and then you can text me or message me on any of the platforms. So we've got 5.8 grams NaHCO3. Some of these things get just so long. Um, okay, so then now we need to convert it to moles. This is where I said before, right? So we can, instead of doing this stepwise, going from grams to moles, and then saving that number, and then separately going from moles of sodium hydrogen carbonate to moles of oxygen, we can line all of these things up and do all of the math at the end. Uh, but we need to determine then our molecular weight of our sodium hydrogen carbonate. So we're gonna have sodium Right, so sodium, hydrogen, easy, carbon, it's 12.01, right? Yeah. And then oxygen, keeping then, right? So we, we've got two um, decimal places on these because ultimately we're adding. And then we have times one sodium, times one hydrogen, times one carbon, but times three oxygens. So we just multiply and then we add these together. And 
and we get 84.01 grams per mole. And now we can use that, right, as grams. So this, when I write it um, grams per mole, right, that is the same as 84.01 grams divided by one mole, right? So that's the same thing. If it helps you to write it out this way, then do that. Uh, because then it's a little bit easier to see that we're going to do 84.01 grams. Uh, can I just abbreviate this SHC? Right, so that's sodium hydrogen carbonate. And then one mole SHC. And then for this next step, right, we're converting then to moles of oxygen. And we know that there are, well, we did it here, right? There's three oxygen atoms from here, three oxygen atoms per sodium hydrogen carbonate. So we're converting from, um, say, one mole SHC is the same as one mole oxygen, or sorry, not one mole, three moles. And again, this can be moles, or this can be atoms, or this can be molecules. Um, because it's dividing by, it's a ratio. And so the units actually cancel out, but for the sake of keeping track of where we're going with our units in a setup like this, uh, it's easier to write out the units that are appropriate for the situation. And then we want to convert from 16, or from whatever moles of oxygen that we're getting to grams of oxygen. Right, so we're canceling with one mole oxygen, 16.00 grams of oxygen. Let's do 5.8. And then, like I said before, I multiply across the top first. So 5.8 times 3 times 16. And then divide by 84.01. And we get 3 point, again, just two sig figs, 3.3, excuse me, 3.3 grams of oxygen. And that makes sense too, right? You can kind of double check this. Um, this number should be less than the total mass of sodium hydrogen carbonate, right? Because sodium hydrogen carbonate also has sodium, hydrogen, and carbon. It's not just oxygen. Alrighty. <clears throat> so we can also look at the mass percent composition or mass percent. Whoops. Accidentally took a screenshot. You look at the mass percent composition or mass percent of an element. <clears throat> and so those numbers are, it's the percent of an element in the, pers uh, it's really the proportion of that element in that compound. So mass of whatever element you're concerned with divided by the mass of the entire sample of the compound. Uh, for example here, right, we have 0 0.358 gram sample of chromium reacts with oxygen to form 0 0.523 grams of the metal oxide. So our mass percent then is going to be equal to, right, we're concerned with chromium, 0 0.358 grams chromium over 0 0.523 grams chromium oxide. Don't know how many oxygens are there, so I'm just going to put an X. So 0 0.358 divided by 0 0.523, and that is equal to, after multiplying by 100, right, 68, um, three sig figs, 68.5%. Chromium. So very simply, the mass percent is the mass of 
the individual element divided by the mass of the compound. And so you'll get other, there are other questions like this. Um, definitely, I think in the, was it in the pre-lab? Um, and so if it says it reacts with oxygen, then it's reacting with oxygen. If it doesn't say it's reacting with oxygen and just reacts with something uh, like sulfur, for example, don't assume that oxygen is involved, right? It's just, it would be chromium here reacting with sulfur. So we use, <clears throat> we can also use mass percent convert, uh, composition as a conversion factor. We can use, um, we can use it to convert between grams of a constituent element and grams of the compound. So the mass percent composition of sodium and sodium chloride is 39%. I'm actually not sure what it's talking about here. But you could just say that um, sodium chloride is... 39% sodium in NaCl. Interesting. So the FDA recommends that adults consume less than 2.4 grams of sodium a day. We've already covered this. The many, how many grams of sodium chloride can you consume and still be within the FDA guidelines if we're using mass percent? So if we say that 2.4 grams of sodium Right, and sodium chloride is 39. Oh yeah, how much how much sodium chloride can we have? Is um. Oh, I think this is what it wanted. Right, so, so, one gram. Of sodium chloride. Is equal to 0 0.39 grams, of sodium. And that makes it a conversion factor. Right, so one gram of sodium chloride is equal to 0 0.39 grams of sodium, right? Because 100% sodium chloride is equal to 39% sodium. So you can just multiply by one gram if one gram is 100%, then 0 0.39 grams is 39%. So then when we use this, we want to know how much salt, sodium chloride, we can have. So sodium times right, one gram NaCl divided by zero, zero, why is this not writing? 0 0.39 grams of so sodium. Did it again. So we do 2.4 divided by 0 0.39 and we get 6.2 grams NaCl. Which I don't remember what I think is the same number that we calculated before. So using mass percent, <clears throat> if, if a woman consumes 22 grams of sodium chloride, how much sodium does she consume? So again, sodium chloride is 39% sodium by mass. So we'll write this out again, one gram. So I'm just taking our percents, right? 100% easy to multiply by one gram uh, to get these numbers. It's actually even easier. Actually, let's do it this way. Let's do it this way, right? Because it doesn't matter actually if this is one gram or 10 grams or 100 grams when we create our conversion factor. If we say that 100 grams of sodium chloride is equal to 39 grams of sodium, right? So we could do 10 grams of NaCl is equal to 3.9 grams of sodium or one gram NaCl is equal to 0 0.39 grams sodium. You might want to use one because then uh, you don't have to multiply or it's, it's one less thing to type into your calculator, right? So let's say we have 22 grams NaCl 
and now we can pick one of our conversion factors. Let's just use 100 to show that it's going to, uh, as an example, right? So we have 100 grams in ACL, 39 grams sodium. So we just do 22 times 39 divided by 100 to get 8.6 grams sodium. Right, so then if we did this as 3.9 grams over 10 grams, goodness gracious. Right, and again, starting with two, 22 grams of NaCl. Oh, shoot. We we're supposed to take a break 30 minutes ago. I need to set an alarm. Okay, so 22 times 3.9 divided by 10. And we get 8.6 grams of sodium. <clears throat> so, again, because it's a proportion, if this, if there, um, as long as you're multiplying the percent on both sides by the same number, it'll work out the same in the end. All right, so here we just took 1%, or 1% as a proportion is 1.00, and this was 0 0.39, converting that percent to a proportion. We can calculate this mass percent composition from the chemical formula. So you find the mass of one mole of the compound and the mass of the element in one mole of the compound. So we have acetic acid. So we'll calculate then the mass of acetic acid. And then we'll calculate the mass of oxygen in acetic acid. So first we want to calculate the, <clears throat> well first we will calculate, we don't have to. We have hydrogen, um, this is important to note too, right? There's hydrogen here, but there's also hydrogen here. Uh, we don't need to have two separate spots for hydrogen, we just need to count all of the hydrogens. So we have hydrogen, carbon, oxygen. We know oxygen is 16.00, carbon is 12.01, hydrogen is 1.01, .01. then we have how many of each of these? This is times four, times two, and times two. And this will give us 1.01 .01 times four, plus 12.01 .01 times two, plus 16 times two. We'll get 60.06. .06. grams per mole, abbreviation for acetic acid is HAC. Okay, mm -hmm. and now we want to know how many um, oxygens, okay, so, so here we go, here we go. We have 60, right, so we want to calculate the mass of one mole of acetic acid, right? So the mass of one mole of, of acetic acid, if you notice, if we multiply this number here by one mole, it's just gonna be the molecular weight. So it's 60.06, <clears throat> grams of acetic acid. And then we know we have, uh, let's use a different, Right, so we, have, we know we have two oxygens per acetic acid. And so our molecular weight of those two oxygens um, is going to be 32. Right, because 16.00 times 2 equals 32 grams per mole oxygen. And remember, this is the, the amount of oxygen in an acetic acid molecule, right? That's why it's 32. So then we just do... 32.00 grams of oxygen. 32.00 divided by 60.06. So we know that our acetic acid is actually 0.0. .0. Oh. 
write this in here, right? Because we're looking for mass percent. So we'll multiply by 100. And that will give us 53 point two eight percent oxygen in acetic acid. And again, this makes sense, right? Because this number, or because 32, right? You look at 32, it's about half of the mass. And we know that oxygen uh, has more mass than carbon and much more mass than hydrogen. So we would expect then that oxygen would be a fairly large proportion of the mass of acetic acid. <clears throat> so you can calculate the mass percent composition, just like we did from the chemical formula. But also, we can determine a chemical formula from mass percent composition. Now, when we do this from the mass percent composition, this is where we're using the empirical formula. So empirical, then, from dictionary.com, meaning derived or guided by experience or experiment. And this is where, too, we talked about early on, when we you know, uh, decomposed water into hydrogen and oxygen, um, decomposed into hydrogen and oxygen, what we were doing there is then count then weighing the hydrogen and weighing the oxygen to see what the mass of either of those were, and we can use that to determine the form or the molecular formula. The empirical formula, sorry, empirical formula. Right, so the empirical formula, this is what we were talking about too earlier, um, gives only the smallest whole number ratio of each type of atom in a compound, not the specific number of each type of atom in a molecule. So it'll also give you, sometimes when you calculate an empirical formula, it'll get like 1.5 or um, 2.5. And that's how you know that it's the empirical, well, one of the ways you can know that it's a, an empirical formula and not a molecular formula. The molecular formula then is always a whole number multiple of the empirical formula, right? And so I mentioned two hydrogen peroxide, H2O2. If we were to look for and decompose hydrogen peroxide down into its masses and determine then the empirical formula, what we would see instead is HO. And then there's, there's other stuff that you can do here to then determine the molecular formula. So the empirical formula sometimes can be your molecular formula, but it is not necessarily. <clears throat> so if we take a sample of water, decompose it in the laboratory, we produce three grams of hydrogen, two point four or sorry, twenty-four grams of oxygen. So how do we determine an empirical formula from this data? Let me Okay, yeah, so we're going to, we'll do this as an example on a slide here in a little bit. So we start with the masses of each element present in a sample of the compound. So for our previous, you know, one we just talked about, right, we've got a mass of hydrogen, mass of oxygen. Then we convert each mass into moles using the molar mass as a conversion factor, right? So we have the molar mass of hydrogen, molar mass of oxygen. Then we divide all the moles by the smallest number of moles. So again, we're going from um, starting with masses, right? Then we're going to moles. And then we're dividing by the smallest number of moles. And then if our moles are not whole numbers, we multiply all the moles to get whole numbers. So you can end up with, ah, yes, here we go. So if you end up with one of these fractional subscripts on the right, then this is the number that you need to multiply to get whole number subscripts. Hide my camera here. Right, so those are the numbers that you need to multiply to get those subscripts. Um, then we write the formula using the numbers of moles as subscripts. It's a lot of steps. Again, it can help to make your own flow chart here. Um, but we're going to do some examples also. OK, so we've got the masses. We start with our masses, and we want to first convert these into moles. So I'm just going to do that right here. 
right? So hydrogen, three grams of hydrogen. Um, we know the molar mass of hydrogen is 1.01 .01 grams of hydrogen for one mole hydrogen. And for oxygen, we have 16.00 grams of oxygen for one mole oxygen. Okay, so we do 3.0, 3.0 divided by, right, because we have grams on top for a conversion factor. So we want to go from grams to moles. We divide by 1.01 .01 to get 2.97 moles of hydrogen. And then we'll do 24 divided by 16 to get 1.5 moles of oxygen. So now we have 2.97 moles of hydrogen, 1.5 moles oxygen. So now we divide by the smallest number of moles. So step one was to convert from mass to moles. Now we divide by the smallest number of moles being 1.5, right? And this, you'll notice, it's very close to three. This is where I was talking about two. There is some, when we're using the mass again, right, you're, you're really approximating the number of moles by using mass. And this is well within sort of the um, experimental error. So when we divide, 2.97 divided by 1.5, we'll get 1.98, which is essentially 2. And then 1.5 divided by 1.5 is going to be 1. So, and this was hydrogen, right? Oxygen. So we can see that we have a ratio then of hydrogen, two hydrogens. So this number of moles then becomes our subscript and one oxygen. And we'll leave that blank because it's implied. So if you can just remember those steps, you can go from masses to an empirical formula, right? This is the empirical formula. <clears throat> There's a difference between where to go. The empirical formula and our molecular formula. For the case of water, we know that this is also the molecular formula, but we had to have prior knowledge to know that. <clears throat> okay, we've got several more examples here. I'm gonna say let's uh, take a short break. Let that example ruminate in your brain. Um, it's hot outside, but I would still say go outside, look at something farther away than your computer screen uh, to reduce eye strain, go to the bathroom. We'll come back at 11.45. Take a short break. And if you want to work on this problem, I'll leave it up. But uh, take a short walk first. All right, so back at 11.45.
Okei. Okei. Let's do some more science. So, now, again, we're uh, in the section using experimental data to determine the uh, empirical formula of compounds. So we have this compound, unknown sample, they decompose it in the laboratory, we get, ooh, that's a highlighter, 165 grams of carbon, 27.8 grams of hydrogen, and 220.2 grams of oxygen. So we want to then calculate the empirical formula of this compound. So, let's spit on my iPad. Uh, we want to convert all these, right? So, first we're going to go, see if we're going to write this down in a way that makes sense. We're going to convert to moles. Then we're going to Is it divide next? Divide by the smallest number of moles, right? Convert to moles. Divide by the smallest number of moles. Um, yeah, and then after we divide by the smallest number of moles, we use that number of moles as subscript. Three easy steps. So, converting to moles first. Uh, for carbon, right, 12.01 grams of carbon for one mole, carbon, 1.01 grams of hydrogen for one mole, hydrogen. We can just do all of these sort of in parallel. And then for one mole of oxygen, 16.00 mole oxygen. Okay, then we'll multiply, multiply, multiply. Um, oh, that multiplies there. And then that's going to equal, we'll just do it for each of these, 165 divided by 12.01, 13.74, and then 27.8 divided by 1.01. .01. Make a little more room on my desk here. It's going to be, should no surprise, almost exactly the same. All right, so it's 27.52, 220.2, 220 divided by 16. It's now 13.76. <clears throat> All right, and then these are moles, moles, moles carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, right? So then our next step is to divide by the smallest number of moles. And actually here, very, very close between oxygen and carbon, um, but just to follow the rules as closely as possible, we'll divide by 13.47. So this is gonna equal one. We can do, we'll do um, 27.52 divided by 13.74 and we get, right, this is, I mean, is what it is, 2.0. And then just for kicks and giggles, we'll do 13.76 divided by 13.74. And to no surprise, it is, for all intents and purposes, 1. So now we've got, again, this isn't really moles at this point, but we've got 1 carbon. We have two hydrogens and we have one oxygen. And so now we use our, so we did, let's go moles, right? We converted everything to moles divided by the smallest number of moles. And now we, whoops, use the number of moles from there as our number, as our subscript. Um, and again, you want to use the most metallic metal first or most metallic element first. Um, which I guess is hydrogen. Um, and this comes down to, I guess, an exception to that rule. So we usually do carbon, hydrogen, and then oxygen, right? So carbon one, hydrogen's two, 
Let me space this out a little better. Carbon, one. Hydrogen, two. Oxygen, one. So then our actual answer will be C, H, two, O. And that is our empirical formula, right? So we don't know um, how many carbons there are exactly, or how many hydrogens or oxygens. We just know that this is the empirical formula. So this is the smallest, these are the, the proportions really of each, the smallest whole number ratio. So we can do this again, but now we're given percent composition. So we have percent mass. So we have 75.69% uh, carbon, 8.80% oxygen, sorry, hydrogen, <clears throat> and we have 15.51% oxygen. So now we've kind of added an extra step here, right? Because we have percentages, but we need mass. Now, the trick to these questions is that as long as we have the same proportions, which we're given by with our percent mass here, it doesn't matter which mass we use to convert to moles. Say that again. So because we have percent mass, as long as we have the same proportion of each element, it does not matter what mass we use to convert to moles. I like to use 100. I like to use 100 grams uh, because that makes this math easy. So essentially we assume, we'll say we just assume we have 100 grams. So how many grams of carbon, carbon do we have then? Uh, so we multiplied all of these by 100 grams to get 75.69 grams of carbon, 8.80 grams of carbon, and 15.51 grams of carbon. So see how that works? It just makes that math very easy. You essentially just remove the percent change it to grams. So now that we have these, and you'll see too that they're in exactly the same proportions as our mass percent. Now we can continue on and just say, okay, we're gonna do now, convert each of these. Oh, I wrote carbon for all of them, huh? Hydrogen, oxygen, not all carbon. So we will now convert, right? So step one, we convert to moles. So we go from 75, and again, 12.01 grams of carbon is one mole carbon, 1.01 gram of hydrogen, one mole of hydrogen, and then 16.00 grams of oxygen is one mole of oxygen. <clears throat> So 75, 75.69 divided by 12.01 is 6.30, 8 8.80 8 divided by 1.01 equals 8.71 and 15.51 divided by 16 is equal to 0. 969. Oxygen, hydrogen, carbon. All right. Now, so we've converted to moles. Now we divide by the smallest. And so our smallest here is going to be our oxygen. So we're dividing everything by 0 0.969. So this one's going to equal 1. 8.71 divided by 0 0.969. 8.99. 
and carbon is going to be 6.30 divided by uh, 0.969 and that equals 6.5 I have a hard time writing on the very side of the iPad like that <coughs> cool so now you can see though that we're ending up with hello come on I'm trying to make all this a little bit smaller so I have a little bit of room to work with so ooh when the iPad gets too warm, as it does when I do this, it um, the touch screen gets a little finicky. So you can see now, this is 6.5. This is really 9, right? Well, let's be honest. Let's just round that to 9. And then we have 1. So this 6.5, though, is a problem. We need to convert that into a whole number. Because the empirical formula is the simplest whole number ratio. Um, and you could flip back to your chart from a while ago, or you could recognize that 0.5 is a half, so we have to multiply everything by 2. So we'll end up with 13, 18, and 2. So then when we write down our formula, right, so now... Uh, number of moles uh, becomes our subscripts. So right, C, all right, so C, 13, H, 18, oxygen, 2. And this is now the simplest whole number ratio. Cool. There's no questions. We can move on. Getting close to the end here. I think it's just a few more examples. So, which means maybe we shouldn't have taken a break when we did, but <clears throat> I will set a timer on my watch in the future so that we can actually take a break every hour, like I said I wanted to do. I just get too excited about the chemistry, you know? So, now we have 1.56 gram sample of copper reacts with oxygen to form 1.95 grams of the metal oxide. What is the formula of the metal oxide? So we have all right, 1.56 grams of copper but we're given now and this is where you got to do a little bit of sleuthing because we have 1.95 grams of the metal oxide. Not the, that's not the mass of the oxygen, that's the mass of the metal oxide. But when we're reacting copper with oxygen, we're adding oxygen to that copper. So we can say that 1.95 grams copper oxide, that's CuO subscript X, because we don't know how many oxygens, minus 1.56 grams of carbon will equal our uh, grams of oxygen. Zero point three nine grams oxygen. So when we calculate our formula, we're going to use this zero point three nine grams oxygen. And now we just do like we've done a few times already and we will convert these into moles uh, I lost my periodic table. There's my periodic table. So copper has a molecular weight of 63.55 grams, one mole. Always good to write your units. And then we're going to do one mole oxygen, 16.00 grams oxygen, right? Molecular weight of oxygen is 16 grams grams per one mole. Oh, my hand is cramping. A lot of examples today. Okay, so now we divide. <clears throat> so do 0.39 divided by 16 equals 0 0.024. Uh, yeah, we'll do 0 0.024. Let's do, let's do one more digit here, four. 
So 1.56 then uh, divided by 63.55 and that equals 0 0.0245. So, again, well, just just to um, follow the rules here. Oh, I didn't get the G. All right, well, that's fine. Ew. That's too small to grab. <laughs> All right, well, the G is huge there. Anyway, so following our rules, we divide by the smallest quantity. But you should be able to see here that this is 0 0.244. 0, 2, 4, 5, it's going to be 1, 2, 4, 4. <clears throat> Let's just see uh, how close it is. 0, 0.0245 0, divided by 0. Just going to let me go on like that, huh? All right. Divided by... 0 0.0244 comes out to 1.00. And we know this is, you know, when you divide something by itself, we're going to go 1.00 forever. And on top here, we've got copper oxygen. So when these combine together in this um, reaction, we're going to get copper 1, oxygen 1, so our answer then is just copper oxide, CuO. Um, all right. Now we can also use, uh, we can also calculate the molecular, molecular formula for compounds. So the molecular formula is always a whole number multiple of the empirical formula. So if we take it, we multiply our empirical formula by 2, by 3, by 4, by 5, it's always going to be some whole number multiple, right? So we need the molar mass to find out what that whole number uh, n is. And when we take the molar mass of whatever our compound is and divide it by the empirical formula molar mass, we'll get whatever we're supposed to multiply by. So we, then we multiply all of the subscripts of the empirical formula by n, right? That's the number that we're determining here. Uh, to arrive at the molecular formula. So I think we have just a couple examples of that. The empirical formula for fructose is C2O, and its molar mass is 180.2 grams. So we have the empirical formula, and we have the molar mass of the actual compound. So, pretty easy. Again, we're just going to do carbon. Hydrogen, oxygen, right? Because the first thing that we need is the, or the thing that we need to calculate is the empirical formula molar mass. So that's what we're going to do on the left over here. So we're getting the empirical formula of fructose is such, and we have uh, carbon, right? 12.01, 1.01, 16.00. And these are all, again, grams per mole grams per mole, grams per mole. And we're going to multiply then, right, by the number that we have in each. So two, one. So this is going to be 12.01 plus 2.02 .02 plus 16 to give us 30.03. And now we know, since we know the molar mass, of the actual molecule, we can say 180.2, wow, that's not 180.2, 180.2 divided by 30.03. And this is another one of those moments where we've got grams per mole on top, grams per mole on bottom, so our result is actually unitless. And our answer will be, sorry, so n equals this, should be something like 6, sorry, 180, yeah, 0.2, divided by 30.03, and it comes out to 6.00, or 00, 
So now we have our formula for fructose, and we're going to take each of those subscripts and multiply it by six. All right, so we have um, carbon, hydrogen, carbon is one, right? That's implied, two and one. If we multiply each of these by six, <clears throat> C6, C6, H12, O6. And that is how you get the molecular formula from the empirical formula. But it, is, it does require that you have the molar mass. So butane is a compound containing carbon and hydrogen, and it's used as a fuel in butane lighters. Its empirical formula is C2H5, and its molar mass is 58.12 grams per mole. Find its molecular formula. All right, so basically the same thing. 12.01, 1.01. Again, these are grams per mole. And we're going to multiply this one by 2. We're going to multiply this one by 5. So 24.01 plus 5.05. Let's do the math quickly. Quick mass, 29.06 grams per mole. This is that again, this is our um should put a box around it, that's what I'm doing for answers. This is our um empirical molar mass, and the actual molar mass is this. So we can do 58, right? So N equals 58.12 grams per mole and 29.06 grams per mole. I believe this should be 2. 58.12 divided by 29.06 is exactly 2, right? So. If we're keeping with our number of sig figs, actually it would be, yeah, it'd be four sig figs, huh? 28.000000. And so then we're going to take our empirical formula of C2H5. We're going to multiply each of these by two. And we're going to get, um, do it over here, C10, sorry, C5, C4, wow, H. 10. Cool. Oh, there's one more. Oh, it's just a blank page. Okay. Are there any other questions about this or about homeworks? About anything about the class? Are you ever going to provide feedback on the homework stuff? Um, you mean like, what do you mean by feedback, I guess? If I... Because uh, like I was looking at the grades, so we have a grade, but there's no feedback on to why it was that way. Does that make sense? Yeah, so there were some, basically I take off a point for every question that you didn't do, but I'm not looking at every question and grading the homeworks. Um, because the homeworks should all be odd problems and those answers are on the back of the book. So if you do the problem, can't figure out why you're getting the wrong answer, that would be then the time to come, you know, send me I a message that, or something. I meant like labs, sorry. That's what I meant by homework. Sorry, what was that? I meant by labs. That's what I meant by homework. I'm sorry, not the actual. Oh. Labs. Uh, in general, I try to put comments down for, because um, the labs are worth 50 points, and then I generally deduct a, a point for each wrong answer. I try not to. So there are some times where you'll have, um, right, you're doing a bunch of calculations. If you do one calculation wrong early on, then that error is going to trickle down through the rest of it. As long as you did the math right for the rest of it, I'm not going to deduct further points for those. Um, 
if you have questions about a specific one, you can contact me afterwards or I can end the recording and we can look at specific things. No, just, just a question. Okay. Yeah. If there's, like I said, in general, I try to put comments, which you should be able to see on the assignment because I can annotate. Um, I can annotate those. So if something's circled, there should be an associate. There should be a comment associated with that circle. But I don't know what it looks like from the student side. I'll look on my laptop because I was opening them on, on the iPad and I couldn't see any annotations. Okay. So I'll look on a different browser. Yeah, yeah. On to... my phone, I could see the annotations, but I couldn't see the comments. Oh, interesting. Okay, I will try to figure out what is going on with that. Yeah. Okay, yeah, I will look into that one. Actually, I think I'll just end the recording here, but. I have a question. 